going live and we're still going. I'm live. There we go. Hello, folks. Got there in the end. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, just getting my swig of cough medicine again for my poor old throat. Um, mm, it's just still a bit scratchy, actually. So I'll try and keep the flu fluids going, the precious fluids. Mm. Hello, Joseph. Hi, right. Thanks for joining us. <coughs> Excuse me. Another miserable old night here. Um, absolutely, yeah, just miserable. <laughs> but uh, there we go, folks. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, tonight we had a, our episode was all about the Fremen and the different aspects of how they're used as geomorphic agents by the Kynes family and by the Atreides family. And uh, really sort of give us a good sort of bit of an insight into the Fremen as, as geomorphic agents. And through them, I suppose we get a lot of Frank Herbert's ideas on ecology. There are educators on desert life. Um, <clears throat> hmm. So, yeah, it's I, I don't know what we think about how the Fremen are treated by Frank Herbert in the series. And um, I think I said it's it's um, you know, it's quite interesting to have a look at them. We, we get a few of Herbert's presentations of ecological ideas like Liebig's Law of the Minimum. Um, and we get the sense that they're perfectionists. Great water discipline, as we all know. Um, but there's something quite systemic about the Fremen, I suppose. So they're, they're quite an interesting bunch. We'll just say hello to everybody arriving in the room and then we'll, we'll get chatting, I suppose. Um, so there's Bob saying hello. Hi, um, Brad's telling me the sound is good. Thanks, Brad. Um, so hello to everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining us, the gang's uh, all here again, as usual. A few more hopefully joining us later. Um, so I hope you're all keeping well, folks. Um, as, as the usual, if you have any questions on tonight's episode, which is all about the Fremen as geomorphic agents, fire away. There's quite a lot to talk about, to be honest with you. And uh, we'll get it straight in there with Joseph saying that urine, urine and feces are processed in the thigh pads. <laughs> I'll never not laugh at that. Yeah, it's it's always a good part of the instruction. It's a very matter of the fact, isn't it? Um, you'd, you'd imagine you'd imagine the people of the noble houses kind of turning their noses up at that. Actually, I think. But yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the stilt itself is pretty interesting. Part of the systemic thinking of the Fremen. And um, I'm looking forward. To, I've, I've seen the, the, the best sort of look I've had at the still suit is, again, that picture we've seen of Sharon Duncan Brewster from the, the promotion of the film as Leah Kynes. And I, I've sort of had a good look. at That's the sort of best um, just kind of still that I've seen. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the still suits look pretty good, actually, I have to say, in the film. And, yeah. Uh, one of the aspects, I suppose, of, of Herbert's ecological message, we were talking about how it, it might be getting diluted a bit in the film because of the absence of certain things, but the other place where the ecological message is really, really delivered, you know, from Frank's point of view, not just the planet itself, but from the, fre the Fremen, um, there are educators in, in ecology. <coughs> Excuse me. Joseph says, um, I always wondered what made Fremen still suits better than the off-world ones. Hmm. It, it's probably that um, level of sort of refinement and use, I think. It's it's the, the practicality of them. I think, you know, I'm, I think it, it talks about, uh, is it quite possibly at the banquet scene where they, I think there's the um, still suit manufacturer, I think, is represented there, if I'm not mistaken. Um Hmm. And I get you get the sense that some of the still suits sold there are on June are um, just they're more expensive, but they're not as good. So it's it's one of those questions, I suppose. Why why are they not as good? And it's it's probably just that the the Fremen rely on them so much to be completely dependent to live in them almost completely that um, I, you know they've learned to maintain them, learned to adapt them. I would say. Um, but they do represent the perfectionism of, again, we're told that the Fremen are perfectionists, really. That's what we should get about them. 
um, they're quite conservative in some ways, but um, the, the perfection comes out in their, their equipment, the way they um, live within the desert environment of the of Iraq is it's it's also completely dependent on these systems that they've created. Hmm. Let's see, yeah, it's a good question, Joseph. I don't think it's really answered, but I would I would imagine that's the the reason why. There's Caron saying hello again. Hello, Caron. Thanks for joining us. Uh, where does the name Fremen come from, both in universe and in real life? Um, I I imagine it comes from free men. Brad. Um. And Freeman, which I believe is a is a name, uh, and I think it's I think it's a first name and a surname. So just that the the Fremen is probably just an adjustment of free men, I think. Hmm. Of mass cheap manufacturing versus handcrafted. That's a good point, Bob's actually mass production is seldom I think as good as uh, handmade goods. If you see what I mean, depends on what you're making, but uh, uh, you get the sense that um, the technology and the still suit. <laughs> You know that's required um there's there's sandwich layers there's the pumping there's all sorts it seems like a very complicated piece of gear and I, i'd imagine it requires a fair bit of maintenance and engineering really to keep keep them going but i imagine that the fremen have adapted their suits over time and know a fair bit more about the technology i suppose as opposed to someone who's maybe picking up a still suit for a bit of a holiday if you see what i mean hmm so Joseph's generations of refinement in your life relies on it, not just for profit. But yeah, I think that's the kind of idea, Brad. Uh, do, 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 do. Joseph Smith says, Babs, I thought Fremen had factories, though I suspect the world is flexible, though it isn't. Rows of people crafting as a factory, as is rows of machines stamping out cars. They do have factories, um, Joseph, um, or manufactories anyway, but we're, we're told that... Um, you know that uh, I think that it's a lot of the Fremen women work in these factories whenever the the men are off fighting, but it does. You know that the, the they need they need ammunition. They need they need all sorts of things. So yes, they do have factories. Um, I think it's part of the siege. To be honest with you, maybe. <coughs> but a community needs all sorts of things. Doo -doo -doo. So yeah, Brad's just saying free man. Yeah, in regards to where do we get the name Fremen? Yeah. Carol says, I'll state this now to lower expectations in regards to certain themes. Yes, I think the movie is primarily about following Paul's arc out of his youth. Um, uh, which does make me curious if they can find a way to go into the ecological aspect more with the Fremen perspective in part two. Um, hmm. I seem to recall the mini series showing tables of women working on stuff. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was just just finished June, by the way, guys. So as we've we've been saying that, I've just been reading the book, and uh, so I've just finished the actual story and um, hit the narrative of Appendix One, Liat Kynes, and I've just literally got into the first page of um, Appendix Two, which is the religion of June. So I've nearly finished the book. Um, but I, I do recall reading that just not too far back. It's just before, you know. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's a whole all sorts of repair and manufacturing going on with the manufacturing going on with the Fremen. Hmm. Let's just catch. So Caron saying that the arc really follows Paul. The the film really works with Paul's arc out of his youth. <coughs> Excuse me which is a big aspect of the book, I, I would say. I think I've mentioned before that if you want to, we can categorize um, June in many different ways. Oh, thank you very much. A cup of jewel around. Thank you, love. Mm. Oh, that's hot. That, that cooled down for a bit. Mm. But, you know, it's science fiction, etc. But one of the ways that we can categorize it is a, what we call a buildings roman, um, which is a coming-of-age novel. So it does fit. It's, it's, it's one way of approaching the book, actually. So that does make sense, Carol, that, that that's the way they go. And it, it is when we, we when we meet Paul Atreides, he's 15. By the time we're through the narrative, he's a man and he's he's gone from not just boy to man, but from man to messiah, if you know what I mean. So it makes sense that that's a good arc, one of the main arcs that they would follow with the character. Um, the, the, what you're saying is that I have a sense of where the first film ends, Carol. And I would argue that most of the ecological lessons that we get from the from June 
should have already happened by part uh, at, at where the film ends. Um, if you see what I mean. So we have we have other there's other ways of introducing us to the ecology of Arrakis, um, but particularly the banquet scene, which is not there, is a is a big educator for the reader, I think, and. Um, the Kynes gender inversion again. I'm not too sure what the message is going to be with the Kynes character. So those are two big aspects of of ecology um, that we're not not having presented in the way that Frank would want. I suppose the other teachers are other educators in terms of um, Arrakis itself is the planet, is I suppose the landscape, etc., and the Fremen and how they interact with it. Um, so the, it's not that we can't get the ecological message. I'm just wondering, you know, as you say, um, is he going to run with that more in part two, etc.? Hmm. It's interesting. Can't wait to see it now. I mean, just just at that, I'm at this point now where I really just want to go and see the film. <laughs> you know, I've got so many ideas about it. I'm just curious about it in many ways. <coughs> as you say, Carol. Um, excuse me. I should probably be planning my second visit by this point, you know. I'll just catch up on your comments, folks. Um, but I, I, yeah, I'm just. I, I hope it isn't. Dis I hope the ecological theme of June isn't isn't displaced at all or, or seriously watered down. Babs is off to do dinner, but is still listening. I'll keep listening up. Okay, dokey, Babs. Enjoy the cooking, and uh, we'll keep the banter going. Thanks very much. Carol was saying. Wasn't there mention of noise from Fremen working on some machinery in some siege? Or am I making things up? Hmm. Um, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure there is a, there is something to do with um, manufacturing within June. Um, let me have a wee quick look. Why aren't you opening? There we go. Let's just have a wee quick nosy, see if I can find something about that. But, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there we go, not too many. Let's have a wee quick look. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, there's the bit about the, the still suit manufacturer from Kartik. Ah, right. Let's have a wee quick look here. Um, The bit that I was thinking on is further. Oh, no. Okay. Click. Check D4 or 5. Manufacture. Factory. Try that. Is that uh, Hara? Let me see. There's a bit here, guys. It's Hara. She recoiled at the harsh edge in his voice. They passed another brightly lighted room visible through an arch on their left. What's made there, he asked. They repair the weaving machinery, she said, but it must be dismantled by tonight. She gestured at a tunnel branching to their left. Through there and beyond, that's food processing and still suit maintenance. She looked at Paul. Your suit looks new, but if it needs work, I'm good with suits. I work in the factory in season. So there you go. That's just... Um, that's just after I think where he's he's just killed Jamis, I believe. Um ba -dum -ba -dum -bum, but uh, that's about that's the Fremen factories, I suppose, that are part of the siege. Let me just see if there's anything else there. Very quickly. No, I don't see anything else there, but there we go, folks. Hope that's of some use. So yeah. Let me just catch up there. But uh, yeah, they're definitely factories, and out of, having to pack them up, etc. It seems that they're as mobile as the Fremen are. Joseph saying, "Eat well, Babs." And yay, the spice coffee did not fail to arrive. Mmm, coffee. Yes, indeed. I'm going to, uh, Carol. I was, I was saying this actually. I've got a great wee book. Um, it's a science fiction book, and I, um, it's called, um, I think it's called the Book of Science Fiction Fantasy Lists. Uh, let me just see, is it here? And if I, my copy, I actually, I probably shouldn't show it to you because I, I opened it up the other day and it fell to bits. So I really need to sellotape it. Um, and it's it's a it's a great book for trivia about science fiction. 
and it has always remembered this for years and years, and I, I was thinking about doing a video on this, Karen, because I like my coffee, was that it has um, a list of science fiction books where the hero is suddenly, you know, in, in dire straits, but someone sort of hands him a cup of coffee and kind of like spinach to Popeye and it's totally revived and sorts the day out. If you know what I mean, coffee's a big thing in some some science fiction books. But absolutely, I used to, I quite like a wee bit of cinnamon in my in my coffee now and then. I would take it if I'm if I'm over on the continent. I would take it that way. Hmm. Well, otherwise, I just like it with a drop of milk. I'm afraid, you know. <laughs> June, a coming of age book says Brad, God Emperor of June, a coming of the ages book. Yeah. Well, that's it's a um arguably I suppose then Children of June is also a building's Roman, and uh, he's come into an age of goodness gracious what you know. <coughs> Mm. But yeah, there we go. Carol said, yes, I love the banquet chapter, Who, I, though I never expected it to be in the movie. It just feels like something that shines in a written medium. Uh, Carol says, mentat, computation in progress. Yes, that's what it was. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's, um, it's such an insight into actually the one thing, I suppose... I think I said the wrong word, by the way. I look back over my videos and I think I said it's not extrapolation heavy. It was the wrong word. It's not exposition heavy. But it, it, it is a really good indicator as to what, what's going on. The, the, only body, the only sort of element that's filmed, the banquet scene. Uh, I said we've got an episode coming. Our next episode's on the banquet scene. We'll have a good analysis of that. But the only time it's been filmed is in the TV Frank Herbert's Dune series. And um, I thought it was very well done. Um, and it, so it has been filmed. It would take up a chunk of the, I think it took up a chunk of that there. It's about maybe 20 minutes long. So it would take up a chunk of the film, but it, it, it works really well. There's a lot of tension, potential violence, intrigue. Um, so it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, and I think it was somebody pointing out the other day, somebody had asked me this. I think it might have been on the comment and, and on the website, and I haven't got around to it. I think I've not answered it actually. Um, that you could view as as the as this sort of the banquet scene as it kind of like a last supper for the Atreides, if you see what I mean. <coughs> Excuse me, Karen. So let's just add, hero is handed coffee as one step, and the heroes, yeah, it, it's kind of like that actually, Karen. But I, I seem to recall in the book, it's quite funny. I'll, I'll see if I can get this and read it for you at some point. But I, I think the one that they point out. The, the example that I remember from the Book of Lists, I think, is Kimball Kennison, who's um, is it the he's the hero of what the Landsman books, and I think he gets an it says he basically gets the crap kicked out of him, you know, and he's just lying as a you know, and then someone goes cup of joe, <laughs> and mm, and da, 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 and he beats up all the bad guys, and and there you go, it's all it's that kind of thing, and apparently it happens in science fiction quite a lot. Enough for them to create a list of books where it does happen, I suppose. So I'll see if I've got uh, my book is so it's got to be sellotaped, Carol, basically. Um, which uh, and it's a great, it is a great book. I must maybe see if I can even get another copy of it. But it's, it's called the, the Book of Um Science Fiction and Fantasy Lists. And I think it's by Maxim Jakubowski, is it? Uh, and another author, I can't remember, but um, I think the title's correct there anyway, you know. Let's see. No. Da, da, da. Season on. Interesting way. In season. Interesting way to express it. Is there any other reference to seasonal work? Hmm. Hang on. Oh, you will Right. I've lost the context there, Brad. I'm, I'm back to. I can't remember what I said there. An interesting way to express it. Is there any other reference to seasonal work? <laughs> Did you leave someone on read? What's that? <laughs> I've lost the thread there, guys. Um, hmm. I've maybe said something. Have I said a malapropism or something like that? It could be. But uh, no, I actually thought the book was here. Um, nope. I'll probably put it somewhere somewhere safe because it needs a bit of sanitating, you know. But no, you've lost me there. I lost the thread there. I can't remember what I said in season two, Brad. Maybe you can remind me. 
but just yeah, add heroes handed coffee as one step in the hero's journey. Yeah, it would kind of if you could put these books together, I suppose it would give us a kind of monomythic uh monomythic kind of thing, you know. Hmm. So folks, any more questions for me? Um on the Fremen or anything to do with the Fremen, etc. etc. Fire away. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I've you've got me a wee bit confused down here. I'm not sure what I said, but maybe you can help me out. It's baffling me. Um, <laughs> did you, and I don't get that either, Karen. Did you leave someone on read? Uh, it's just the text and the inference. I'm not getting it. But there we go. Um, I'll tell you what I was having a wee think about was the destruction of Arrakis. Karen equals 1 equals 0 0.999. But if it be, nope. <laughs> hmm. Sorry, guys, I'm just a bit baffled by it. I'm not understanding at all what's going on down there. But I'll just, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll have a, I'll chat for a minute or two until I can figure it out. Um, <laughs> well, as I said, the Fremen, I think, are, um, Everybody's kind of monkey, really, in, in the Jin universe. I don't know what you think, but they're absolutely manipulated by everybody. Um, and we talked about how the Kynes family are able to come in on top of the missionary of Protectiva, manipulate them that way, religiously, superstitiously. And it sets up this idea of economic, um, economic religious ecology, you know. Oh, the destruction of Arrakis. Did I leave someone on read? Ah, sorry, was I running a thread of thought there? <coughs> Excuse me. I had thought about... Ah, right, yes, this is what I was thinking, guys. Tell me what you think. Hi, Ryan. I was thinking, um, hmm, why is Arrakis blown up? Why is it Why is it destroyed? And we were talking about why it's so shocking and, and how it brings our ecological theme, really, in June to an end. Um, hmm... Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> many, many books down the way, down the road, I suppose. Um, and I, well, it made me think. It made me think. <laughs> no worries, Karen. Just kidding. It made me think. Why? And I, I. But really, what what does it serve, and what's it, what's Frank trying to do with that? And I was actually thinking about the repetitive cycles uh, of patterns within um, within the June series. And how they're, in a sense, if you like, revolutionary patterns. And I don't know if you get me when I'm sort of trying to say um, revolutions just bring the same nonsense back again, don't they? Um, uh, <laughs> let me catch up here. Works in the still suit factory in season. What delineation is there? Oh, right. God, you guys. I was going to say, well, in season could be killing Harkonnens and not killing Harkonnens, if you like. But right, thank you. I've got you now. <laughs> uh, I was getting very confused there earlier. I ah, all this talk of factory work. <laughs> um, yeah. So in terms of the, why blow up the planet, I don't know what you think, but I got the sense that if you're talking about revolution, and that we don't learn from our mistakes, that we actually just go back and revolutions to go around and around and around again, and. Um, the idea that revolutionary forces are often conservative once they get power, if you see what I mean. What was he trying to say about Western man's systemic approach to ecology, etc., etc., by blowing up his planet? And that's the bit I was thinking about. It, it, it wasn't about revolution. It was about destroying a, 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 destroying a thing, destroying an ideology, perhaps. I don't know. It got me thinking about it. Hey, noodles. You know, Pat. <laughs> Sorry, my small dog has just leapt up on the bed here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, just in terms of the same iterations, and um, you know that idea of those who do not learn from their mistakes are condemned to repeat them for forever, that kind of thing. And so I was really wondering what was the lesson of the planet being destroyed, you know? But there we go. Carol says our hard and killing seasons are annoying. I'm allergic to. Them. Yeah. I get the idea that, well, here, I mean, what delineation is there for seasons in June? It must have seasonal weather, you'd think, wouldn't it? <coughs> Excuse me. 
you know, in, in terms of its position to its sun and stuff like that. But I'd imagine it just gets hotter. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think season, hardcore and killing season, I think that's a good way of looking at it. Oh, oh, here, I know what. I mean, little time stamps on there. Keep me top chat. Ah, I know what's wrong here, guys. I've got the wrong chat activated. There we go. And remember, we were talking about me trying to keep a track of what's going on. <laughs> right. Let's just see if did I miss anything there. Or was that just general? It was a bit of general confusion on my part earlier anyway, so we'll not worry about it. Uh, it's all good. <laughs> Sean McCall. Hi, Sean. Hey, y'all. Are the Fremen painted with frank ideas about the USSR in terms of of their adherence to the scientists' plan, i.e. Kynes. Does Frank have any specific writing on the USSR that you encountered? Oh, uh, that's a good question, Sean. Um, I, th I think there's certainly a suggestion of some, uh, some of the Cold War stuff going on there. Um, I think I mentioned that the, the idea of the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen was meant to although incorrectly kind of suggests over towards the Soviet Union, that kind of thing. Um, I think I think there's elements of what was going on from the Cold War in June. Um, I'm not too sure, to be honest. I, bear with me one second. If... Hmm. Let me see. What have we done? I'll have a wee look into that. For you, Sean, I would need to have a nosy at a couple of books, um, to be honest with you. He does have concerns about uh, sort of future terrorism and stuff like that. Um, that's stuff that he's I've definitely read by him. But um, no, I, this, I haven't. I can't think of anything offhand. But I'm actually thinking that Timothy O'Reilly's books would would his biography on Frank Herbert would probably be the place to check for that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pardon me again. Um, In terms of the, but your question is in terms of with Frank, are the Fremen painted with Frank's ideas about the USSR in terms of their adherence to the scientists' plan? For example, Keynes, does Frank have any specific writing on the USSR that you encountered? Uh, I'm not too sure, I'll, but I'll look into it for you. Um, the scientist plan, it's part of what, in terms of what Herbert calls it, Sean, he's a term for it, and he calls it as the Presbyterian fixation. Um, so in terms of Keynes definitely represents that, that type of thinking. Um, and I'd argue that the Presbyterian fixation kind of thing, from, from Frank Herbert's point of view, is, is kind of Isaac Asimov's type of thinking. Uh, any problem can be solved with, with more tech, basically. Um, so I will look into that for you, Sean. It's a good question, but I'm not too sure. But he, do, he does comment on a number of things. Um, but the, the scientist plan, that, that is very much Western man, as he puts it. And so I, I don't think he would include the Soviet Union in that. Um, it, it, interestingly enough, I, th I think there's quite a bit of a difference. And I have, um, let me see, have I got something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, as much as, you know, the Strugatsky brothers are Soviet-era science fiction writers, I've got this great wee book here, um, which I read ages ago. I'll just show it to you. It's a collection of the finest in Soviet science fiction, edited and translated by Mira Ginsburg. It's called The Ultimate Threshold. There we go. And it has a bunch of... Uh, it's, it's a collection of Soviet science fiction stories. <coughs> A uh, good be set of them, different authors. Sorry, that wasn't helpful, was it? Um, Heinrich Althoff, uh, Gleb Anfalov, Anatoly Dneprov. Uh, let me see who else have we got. Roman Podolny, Herman Maximov, Olga Larionova, um, Igor Roshikovatsky. If I said that right, there's a whole bunch of them here. I do, I do remember reading this kind of stuff, and I know it's slightly segued from your question, Sean, but it's I find there are very different sensibilities about America, Soviet science fiction, particularly the scientific focus stuff, if you see what I mean.
Karen says, maybe a quick key question, key to the question is considering who blew the planet up and what they represent in the whole thing. Um, mm, well, isn't that the honored mattress, I believe? Uh, I can't remember. Who, who does blow the planet up in the end, or is it a self-destruct? Can somebody remind me? Um, my memory's not too good on those um, later books. Let's see, at least from the Bene Gesserit point of view, the destruction of June was to limit the oracular power of the powers of awareness in the sandworm. Was the larger point, what the larger point Frank is making, it does seem like you're onto something, ending the cycle of revolutions. Yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to point out, Sean. Um, because we have all of these reiterations. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to run down quickly. Karen says, yes, the Honoured Matt Race blew it up. And I'll run back again just to, so I can <laughs> bring that in. Um, larger point, Frank, is... Benny Jesuit, quickly, Sean, it's your point as well. Do a number of things to limit oracular power. We talked about them, how they muddy the, the oracular waters, if you like, with um, tarot. Hmm. But the, the larger point Frank is making, um, I, do, I, I wondered, and it started to make me think that revolutions are kind of stupid. Um, and it is that sense in the true word of the true meaning of the word, you know, just to go around again and around again. And that's what we do. And it's part of the whole cyclical setup um with engine and, and I, I had to make I just had to ask why you know and so uh, you can get the sense are we going from garden planet to desert planet to garden planet oh no back to desert what what uh, you know boom um but we do have this movement about and the fight the final episode will be about how the planet continues to go through these different changes but it seems yeah it's um it, 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 I think it, 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 it's about breaking a way of thinking, possibly, if there's a metaphor there. And, and I think, you know, Arrakis is pretty important to Frank Herbert to blow up your own planet. It's, it's an interesting thing. Why? If, you know, this is, this is the thing you're famous for, but why blow it up? And I think there has to be some kind of lesson there. Um, it's, a, it's almost a bit like Arthur Conan Doyle killing off... A, Sherlock Holmes, if you see what I mean. Though he did that for different reasons, but it's kind of that, uh, um, you know, as um, Brad says, why blow up the planet? Because Cam, that's why. <laughs> mm. Bob said, the destruction of Arrakis, Honor and Matt trying to kill Duncan Gola as he's sex enslaved them. <laughs> as he's sexually enslaved them. Also possibly trying to destroy the divided God. Yes, the hot season and the bloody hot season, Brad. Yeah, I'm getting better at catching up with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Carol says, maybe blowing up the planet signals that at some point you should have outgrown the dependence on something instead of sticking to it forever after getting in tune with it. It's a very good point, isn't it? You've got to stray for evolution, not revolution. Cooperation, not competition, isn't it? Um, that kind of idea. But yeah, it, it, so I, I, sorry, I was just chatting with you guys last night and I just went, why? You know, and I, and I, I totally agree. Um, who, who pointed it out there? Um, blowing up the plant at some point, you should have outgrown the dependence on something. Uh, and you could take that maybe metaphorically and for the reader and literally for Frank, possibly. You know, it's him applying his own lessons. I think it's interesting. Uh, as I said, we're all a wee bit shocked when Arrakis. That, that was the that was the something I hadn't got because I suppose when I was doing a lot of this work, I didn't really get to communicate or talk to people who like June because I, I didn't know any because um, there weren't any around here. And um, it's good that little conversations like this make you go hmm. And I would never have got the sense. It's only from talking to you guys that I actually got the sense that I you know, people were genuinely shocked. By the planet going boom, you know, and what, you know, so because uh, I was, and I didn't, I didn't really think that that was a sense that people had. So it's made me think about it, and it, obviously it's something that impacts upon the reader, and you, uh, and therefore it makes me want to know more and more why. If you see what I mean, hmm. Sean McAllister said Herbert is clearly a Hobbesian heretic. He rejects revolution while also rejecting Leviathan, the centralized state. Ah, interesting. 
Cowan says, another way to put it, fixing the ecological issue should not be the end goal. It should be what allows you to evolve further without struggling with the basics. Hmm. Brad saying, well said, Carol. Yeah, you get you get the sense that at the minute with the, the ecological problem is a problem and we must fix it, if you see what I mean. And we've got X amount of years to fix it. And you talk about long-term thinking and so-called long-term thinking. Most governments don't work more than five years ahead, really. Um, you know, the, you know, and governments come and go in reverse of what the previous government did. It's back and forward. And government here, for example, is adversarial. So you have one side and you have a side in opposition. And usually when you vote one out, they just swap across. And you've got the same people doing the same thing here, dismantling what the others have done every five years. So in terms of how, how we look forwards, we're talking about, oh, there'll be maybe we'll all be extinct by 100. The planet's got thousands of th millions of years ago to go. And we should be looking at our species millions of years down the road and keeping it alive, not just for the next 10, 20 or 100. It's it's not about um, fixing a problem. It's, it is about living on a planet and keeping it that we can survive on it. Um, so, yeah, I wonder what is he saying? Fixing the ecological issues shouldn't be the end goal. It should be what allows you to evolve further without struggling with the basics. It's a, yeah. That's a really well put point, Carol. Yeah, as Brad says, well said. Um, th there's got to be some way of moving forward and understanding that, you see, as long as people look at trees, for example, as money, as, uh, that's that's the real problem. The big crutch in the, in the junior universe for everyone is the guild. They're the biggest crutch of all, and they represent the economy of the, of the universe, I think. Hmm. It is. It's, it's something that's just sort of caught my, caught my mind a wee bit. Why do it? Um, yeah, you know, we have some good, uh, interesting points there. And it has, to, it has to be part of the lesson, you know, I think. Sean says, like Leto II, breaking from worm to sand trout, the state fractures into many little leviathans post Leto II, which Frank seems to like, and like everyone is saying, it allows evolution without stagnation. <coughs> mm. And I post lead with a second as we get the scattering as everyone's kind of thrown out there. And, um, you know, go out and search. Well, you get the sense that some people don't leave the Imperium, but others do. Other groups head out. And it kind of reminds me, I suppose, then what we get, that sense of uh, the returning honoured mattress being tougher and more brutal and deadlier. We get that. Okay, so they've evolved. But what, what's been out there that you get the sense that they would have had to have been possibly predated on or you know there's something quite nasty out in the in the in the unknown universe if you see what i mean it reminds me a wee bit of the agogi the spartans you know <clears throat> where they hoof their kids out for a year and if you, you know you don't come back you don't come back live on your own see if you can survive hmm sean saying good points karen on doc thank you sean karen says by the time you're done with heretics, you already know caring about ecology should be basic. So, bam, let's go further. Mm. Yeah. And as I said, it is, a, it, is a, it is a sort of kind of, uh, okay, well, we've got the elements carried on. And if we start start to understand that, then don't they have a sand, sand trout or something on board the ship, I think? Goodness, I'm going to have to get... Well, I'll be starting the SIA, I, I suppose, very shortly. Um Part of me remembers, I think, children, well, I'd say June Messiah is the book I remember best after June. But uh, part of me kind of wants to jump forward to The God Emperor and just read it on its own. Um, I think it should be naughty of me, but I think I shall just be thorough and get through the June series one more time, you know. Hmm. So the, the ecology, the I suppose, yeah, it's stopped teaching us, hasn't it? Is it time to kick away the crutch? As somebody pointed out there. Um it's a very interesting point. Does does Frank want us to kind of look at, you know, go and have a look at these things ourselves? And it is, um, the, there is a bit of a tone shift, I think, in the last two books. They tend to go a wee bit with, the, with his ideas of war being um, like a sexual rhythm that kind of overcomes mankind periodically. I keep looking for this book that he, he's, he was quite interested in. I can't find it. Um, in fact, hang on a second. Just had an idea as to where I might find it. 
Bear with me one second, folks. Oh, 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 oh goodness gracious. Postcards falling out. I was thinking I might maybe see if there's a reference to the USSR here. Oops, sorry, dropped stuff. What did I drop? Postcards are dropped. Joyous Invasions. Theodore Sturgeon. You have Gammy Zam. That's a nice cover for you. you have Gammy Zam Yatin's Way. It's a bit weird. <coughs> Excuse me. You postcards. Um, let me see. Do, 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 do. Just catch up with your thoughts a wee second, folks. Uh, ba -da -ba -da. Then we're done with Harry's going on caring about the college should be basic, so bam, let's go further. Part of the point has to be transforming the Bene Gesserit, says Sean. Think about it. The most powerful of Bene Gesserit was the Emperor's soothsayer living on Kaitan. Uh, during God Emperor of June, the leader based on Chapter House. Sean McAllister, in the last two books, we see Chapter House closely. It's a paradise planet almost. The sandworms transforming that planet have to also be a part of this, meaning it could mean millions of dunes in the scattering. Ah, lots of planet with worms on it. There's there's one thing I thought was kind of interesting that you get a wee, wee bit of a sense, maybe it's, it's to do with the change of times, I think, that Chapter House is a planet, I think, is is, is kept a, a secret where it is, and, and maybe it moves, it's a different planet, moves around. Um, If you know what I mean, the Bene Gesserit move. Yeah. Kind of confusing sometimes. Brad Rose says, Karen, evolve without struggling for the basics. Does sound like a post scarcity society. It does. Um, the problem is the more we are capable to produce, the more we reproduce, we always go to the edge. And uh, yeah, it's kind of your water, shelter, food, water, food, shelter thing that you get that kind of idea at the front of June, don't you? And there's certain things that we all need to survive, and we should all have them, the basics. Um, if we live in a society where that happens, where we've all got everything that we need to, uh, you know, eat, drink, keep warm, have a roof over our heads, and have access to medicine to look after our health, and everything else should be a bonus, I suppose. Hmm. But yeah, that I suppose is the kind of if we if we get to that point where you can take society, all all the planet that way, then you'd have a post scarcity civilization, wouldn't you? Excuse me. Let me just catch up, folks. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Let's see. Just talking Sean's point about the worms transferring chapter house. Carnival. June is destroyed and reborn, says Sean. The Bene Gesserit still use Seleucus Secundus. So now most Bene Gesserit will grow up in harsh conditions. Hmm. Brad says, has anyone seen the documentary The Future Eaters, a documentary series? Um, I, I haven't myself, Brad, no. Uh, if you let us know a wee bit about it. <clears throat> what was I going to look up here quickly? Not sure. That's true, Brad. Birth rates are lowest in the advanced societies. Oh, I must have missed something there. <clears throat> Carol said, I'd say if we as a society would get the basics, we wouldn't reproduce excessively anymore. I don't know. I think there's um, I think there's sort of natural rhythms to things, but I suppose was it was there, there's sort of odd population gaps um, in a number of societies because of World War Two. No, let me just see if the U.S. Somebody was asking about the USSR. If you, I don't see anything referenced in this. Russia at 114. Let me have a wee quick look. Yeah. I suppose somebody was asking about the Russian. What was it? The Soviet uh, scientist idea. The book possibly to look at that under pressure is a kind of Cold War paranoia uh, book. Let me see what's Russian here. <laughs> see if we can point it find it 
But otherwise, uh, what you were asking, Sean, there's nothing else really in this book about uh, the Soviets. I was going to look something else up in this, but I can't remember what it was. The worm turns. Oh, I wonder if it was because Frank had said anything about blowing up the planet. Was that it? Hmm, not too sure. It all begins again. Yeah, it's a good read, by the way, folks. Sorry, I'll not not making for entertainment talk, uh, entertaining chat. Is it me sitting looking at a book? Um, let's have a wee look and just catch up with you. Um, birth rates are lowest in the advanced society. Hmm. So if we as a society would get the basics, we wouldn't reproduce excessively anymore. Yeah, I mean, I don't see China coming out with a three-child policy in the place of its one-child policy seems a kind of kind of stupid. Um, you'd, you'd imagine two is a, is a good limit, I think. Um, uh, <laughs> the advanced word, yes, good use of quotation marks there, Sean. <laughs> Let's see, um, says Brad. Ryan Scar says, so much like Silent Green. Ah, Silent Green is really good. I like Silent Green. Uh, but, but if anybody hasn't seen Silent Green, check it out. It's a really good film. It's it's the Harry Harrison book, Make Room, Make Room. So it is it is a overpopulation kind of, uh, yeah. We all know what Silent Green is, don't we, folks? You've got to tell them. So <laughs> if anybody doesn't know, I was, I was going to say, <laughs> that'll be quite interesting. Maybe, again, sometimes times change maybe people don't know silent green at all but if um if anybody hasn't seen it it's a really good science fiction film with charlton hessen and um it's edward g robinson's last film i think it's a really good murder mystery kind of thing and uh, a very famous become a quite a famous trope these days i think hmm and it's based on the book make room make room by harry harrison it's a cracking film actually i really love it hmm Guess what I'm saying about the destruction? The Bene Gesserit leadership environment goes from Kaiti into Chapter House to a new June Chapter House hybrid. Did Frank want the Bene Gesserit shaped by June? Mm. I see what you mean. Yeah, it's again, it's our environment making like that type of harsh environment. What is it? And the Bene Gesserit sort of, their original mistake was that they, have they learned the lesson that they're affected by their ideas uh, of evolution, and that their plans actually affect them, that they don't, the problem we said before, Sean, is that all the groups in the June universe don't consider how their various plans of evolution, etc., whatever, how they actually affect their own group, if you see what I mean. Brad Rose is saying, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So did want, did Frank want the Bene Gesserit shaped by June? Quite possibly. And I, and I think with at the, at the point where the last book ends as well, all, the one thing always to remember, I think, within the, the six June books, Sean, is that um, Bev's influence on Frank Herbert and especially her influence on the Bene Gesserit characters, I think, is, is particularly important, you know. But, yeah, it's good to be still on topic. <laughs> Brad. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm amazed I can still talk, to be honest with you. I think this is the 26th or 27th one of these we've done in a row. And uh, I've had a dodgy throat the whole way through, and and absolute. I've been starting to get rid of all the stuff in my head. Actually, the medicine's starting to work, but my throat's just. I think it's because I'm doing quite a bit of talking, you know. <clears throat> Sean says getting the basics taken care of sounds a little like socialism too, but I never get the sense that Herbert likes that pathway. Anyone want to speculate on Herbert's politics? He doesn't strike me as a mainline conservative. Hmm. I'd say he's a capitalist, American capitalist, in my opinion. Um, probably middle of the road. Do, do, Doc says, um, please note down that documentary. I think you'll find it's the, the Future Eaters. Oh, yeah, sorry. That was, we were losing a bit of track in a few places. I will do. I'm still to look at Babacuria, Babacuria uh, as well. <laughs> the Future Eaters. What's that about, Brad? Sounds interesting. Eaters, fage. Hmm. Um. So Herbert's politics. Yeah, I. 
I don't know, probably a bit eclectic, Sean. I'd, I'd say that there is clues to this stuff, and it probably is in um, uh, the Road to June, or is it the Dreamer of June and, and the the, the uh, Timothy O'Reilly book? Um, I I don't know. I got I got the sense that it was individuals he didn't trust, and the you know his his opinions on the power structures. What is politics would be? I don't I don't know too much about American politics at the time. Pardon me. We do know Sean that he worked as a speechwriter, etc. For some people, and he was the comment that he made. That I understand is well known is that he was always pleased that nobody he worked for got elected. Uh, so he's, he, you get a sense that he's kind of trying to undermine things from within. If you see what I mean. <clears throat> um, I don't think he's a conservative. I don't. Um, hmm. Well, I think he's a capitalist. Um, generally, um, I suppose in America, is it, uh, are you conservative or liberal? Is that pretty much the way it goes these days? I'm not too sure. I suppose that's a bit like that here in Britain, um, here in the United Kingdom. Sorry. Do, 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 do. Yes, the, the the future readers, I've got it down there, Brad. I will have a wee nosey. I do like a good documentary. Uh, I think one of some, yeah, I suppose that octopus one was the last one I watched recently. Just, yeah, it was very good. I enjoyed it. Hmm. So, no, I'm not sure if anybody does know, uh, if anybody's cl more clued up on that. But, um, I mean, uh, it, uh, it depends on what you mean by politics as well. I suppose I have a different, quite a different definition of it than most people, Sean. Um, but, uh, yeah, I get the sense he's probably quite easygoing, liberal-minded person, if that helps. But... Uh, and he's ecologically minded, but I think he needs to make. He's he's focused on making a living, I suppose. Um, I think I think it's said that his as religious or spiritual ideas were quite eclectic, if that helps. But uh, I wouldn't really know too much about that. It's probably in um, Brian Herbert's biography of his father, I would say, because there's stuff there about him writing speech for speeches, and I think he wrote stuff for uh, somebody. I think some guy involved with uh, the Scientology, not the Scientology people. Sorry. Um, general semantics people, I think, and something to do with that. Brad says, I love the way the Fremen show Paul and Jessica their water cash, and the youth Paul doesn't blurt out, Where's your spice stash? It's truly wise beyond his years, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they don't show them where all the spices, I suppose, but um, hmm. What's my definition? Frank seems very interested in the person-to-person -person politics versus the mass political shit show that is the US political discourse, says Sean. Well, I'm, I'm a person that parks himself in the classical world, Sean, so my definition of politics is this. Politics is the science of the happiness of humanity, where the happiness of the individual is subservient to the happiness of the collective. Um, I actually don't believe that bit, so I'll just give... That's Aristotle's definition from the Nicomachean Ethics, Sean. I'll give you my own, it's the same, but I just stopped earlier. I'd say that politics is the science of the happiness of humanity. Full stop. There you go. That's, so that's my modern uh, interpretation. I don't think it's okay to crush one person to make you all feel a little bit better, if you see what I mean. And I think how, how a society treats an individual speaks volumes about that society. And uh, yeah, I think we're, we're, a lot of our democracies these days you know, are happy for the individual to fall fall by the wayside, if you see what I mean. So that's my um, definition of politics. It's a very, it's a classical one, I'm afraid. But um, that's what it is. Politics is a science that is about making human beings happier. Pretty much. I think it's a good definition, you know. Um, government is not the same as politics, Sean. They're two very different things. Um, I, I think it's interesting that um, is it Plato's Plato's book's called The Republic, you know, uh, which is Plato's a Greek writer. The book's got a Latin word for its title. Plato's Republic is a better name for it would be on government, if you see what I mean. <coughs> Excuse me, but politics and government are two different things. That's my own opinion. Uh, let's just catch up with you guys because I think we've got a few comments on that. So, uh, so no one in the US practices politics. I don't know. Are you interested in your happiness? 
It seems to be a thing that different countries are starting to be in. We talk, you'll see this on the news. People are going, oh, Nor Norway, the people are happiest in Norway. And you're going, what? Why? What? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's not that they're richer, it's that they're happier. And you kind of go, well, what are they doing? Because my life's a misery, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So um, I don't, I, I'm not too sure. Um, American politics looks very similar to the you, you, you American politics looks like and has the trappings of the Roman Empire, if you understand me. It's, um, yeah. Um, and I don't know how it works at the more local level. I imagine that's quite different, but I'm talking about your nation, your, uh, as, a, as a United States, if you know what I mean. Um, and I know each state has its, does, each state's you've got federal law and then you have state law, so each state has its own, you know, way of going, I suppose, if that's correct. So I'm, I'm, I'm a wee bit, all we really get about, um, we don't get too much about American politics on over here, guys, but um, basically it looks quite uh, bizarre from where, but uh, ours is no better, no, don't get me wrong. Um, in fact, you know, ours looks terrible compared to yours. <laughs> so there we go. So politics is a system to distribute blame instead of fixing the problem. Ah, <laughs> popcorn, well said. Hmm. I don't know if you, if you backtrack and look at these ancient Greeks, you know, they they are trying to understand their world and build a better society. Uh, they want to have a you know, eudaimonia is the word we keep saying, a good spirit, and I, their intentions are good. Um, well, you know, but uh, yeah, we need to distinguish politics and sense of what it is in practice and what it should actually be. I guess well, all things have a theory and application, don't they? Um, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Ryan says, damn, I spilled my whole beverage. Got to get some tiles. Don't you know where your tile is, Ryan? <laughs> Don't you have a tile handy? Uh, just in case, you know? Yeah, I got one just over there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I generally, I, 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 in terms of American politics, I suppose, if you look at June, we 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 see you see I've put Donald Trump into your video my videos. Um, he's tried a few things that you could argue are part of uh, part of Frank's warnings. He's attempted the I'm the Messiah, I'm the chosen one. Uh, you know who's that? Who's for the, whose benefit is that for? Um, you know there's the environmental thing, etc. He's tried to play a few kind of what you call bread and circus games. If you see what I mean. Um, now, yeah, if you want, there's another one, really, Carol. Uh, uh, who was it who was asking? Is it Sean? If you want a Roman Roman definition of politics, it's probably just bread and circuses, if you understand. Control the masses. Um, keep them fed and keep them entertained. Uh, it's a very well-known phrase, you know. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> so I just backtrack it. But yeah, and... Um, I don't know, as I always say, I don't think anybody needed to be warned about Donald Trump, but obviously people do. So the American politics is, is absolutely baffling to us now because of the Trump. Um, I suppose we, we have something similar with uh, Boris Johnson, but I, th I think you're, you're Trump trumps Johnson in every way, if you see what I mean. But, but American politics is just baffling to, to me now. Um, I understand your system kind of in the structure. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's like the American dream has become the American nightmare, I suppose, and I, I which is a shame because you know a lot of the world look used to look to America, you know, as a land of the free, home of the brave, all of this kind of stuff that you have kind of sold us over the years. But America always did look like a very positive, to me anyway, inclusive, um, multicultural society. Um, and uh, that's how America always appeared to us. And it, it now seems that America is all of those things, but not not inclusive, if you see. I mean, it's a very fragmented multicultural society. And I think it's it's such a big... I mean, it's North America is pretty much a continent, if you like. <coughs> I think you have... It's, it's a problem with so many different issues and all over the place. It's a, it's a, it's a scale problem sometimes, I think. But I'm, I'm a bit baffled by American politics. And things like liberalism, I don't know, the word liberal means free, to be free, to be liberated. Um, 
you know, and I know you can have Republican and Democrat. Um, uh, I even like the kind of use of those two words. One one resides in the people, and the other one is the force of the people. If you like, they're interesting. But um, you know, so I mean, my country's are, this country's people have been migrating here from here to America for it's a big part of um, Irish culture. I'd argue that there's a large proportion of American population is of Irish descent. <coughs> Quite a bit by this by this stage going down generation after generation, you know. But um, so no, it's a wee bit baffling sometimes. And, and at the same time, you've got a lot of the, the size of America. that You've got some serious ecological problems going on at the moment, I think. And um, hmm. But it is, it's kind of fascinating. But watching Trump for four years has been, I think, has made us all quite anxious. I don't know about you guys, but he's just been a, you know, to us, he's a very obvious nut. Um, <clears throat> you know, and I just, I don't know, I, I've seen him do, he's done an awful lot of harm to people and he's cost lives. And, and that's often, I think, that the, the leaders at the top don't really realise, the politicians don't know the ripple down effect of what they do. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to get a wee sip of the cough medicine, folks, because my throat's getting a bit uh, thrashy, I think is that the word, and I'll get a few of these comments going. Hmm. Oh, that. Nah. That's horrible. <clears throat> Future Eaters looks at how, this is the documentary Future Eaters that Brad's recommending, looks at how different cultures abuse the most accessible resource. Then only after it is depleted, they learn to live sustainably. It explores the Maori, Arab, Aboriginal pe peoples and other isolated cultures and how the same boom bust sustainably pattern happens wherever humans go. Interesting. That sounds quite good. Mm. We have, you kind of, again, you've got the opposite of that within June. Um, you see this idea, the ecological idea of what's what's called Liebig's Barrel and the, what's Liebig's Law of the Minimum, um, which is how the Fremen, is, so it's the least, you know, your society, is the, uh, your place in nature, I suppose, is determined by what's least available, not by what's most available. And of course, water is the least available thing in June, you know. Hmm, it's worth looking at, actually, by the way, Liebig's barrel. It's an interesting idea. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, but oh. Bark Langer. Hello, Bark Langer. Good day to you, sir. I caught you live again. I think your dissertation on politics and government is great. It's just inconceivable. To make people to make the people happy to me would be almost everybody. Hmm. For example, if the US, if half the people are dissatisfied, which they clearly are, then how is such a bipartisan margin ever able to be fixed without a civil war? It doesn't look good, it seems. I have an idea on that, Bart Winder, if you want, really. Um, you can have isonomic government, which means every person is your government. You don't have political parties. The, the, everybody votes every day. And with modern technology, you could probably achieve this. Um, the point is, how would you go, okay, well, so many people, you can have a point where your society has to function with governance, and then you can choose how to go forward. And instead of going, we vote this way or we vote that way, why don't you have it if you have 70% of your population, you can have a secondary stage to isonomic voting, and you could call, I don't know, call it discussion or whatever. But um, it's simply put where you have to get, you have to get 95, say, call it 95% agreement within your population. So it becomes the 70%'s job to encourage the 30% to think that way. I don't know, but we all have our opinions and we kind of, I think, um, <coughs> I, I live in quite a small country with quite a small population, so isonomia, which is pure democracy, would work here. It wouldn't take much to set up. And um, yeah, you simply, you, you, you can present it in a similar way to Athenian democracy. And... Um, if you know much about that, it's not that, except that it's all inclusive, I think. And you could get to the point where you'd actually office, offer citizenry protection to anybody that cro crossed your borders. Um, it's it's a bit of a futuristic idea based on an old one, but um, isonomia is, we, we've actually had uh, our government walk out on us for probably close to two years, and our, com our country has run itself without them. And our politicians have now come back, if you see what I mean, and now they're all wanting our votes. 
And the thing is, we, I, I, we, we're entrenched in a certain way of thinking in Northern Ireland, but the one thing that all of our political parties have demonstrated to us, and a political party is a mob as far as I'm concerned, it's a group thinker, it doesn't think intelligently. Um, all they've demonstrated to us is that we don't need them, and that actually party politics is harmful to our... Party politics has been tearing this country apart for 50 years. And uh, if you want to know who's mainly responsible for all the violence in this country, it's our political parties. And they stoke, you know, the the different aspects of our culture here, you know. Hmm. But so, um, it's an idea, isn't it? <coughs> At the minute, you have representative democracy in the US, same as we do here, which means the power that you have in your vote, you hand it to someone else. Uh, who basically says, uh, pick me A or pick B, if you know, and then they go and represent whatever they particularly want and whatever they've told you that they'll represent, I suppose. But it, it, as you hand your power away in a modern democracy, it's you, which is not the way it was meant to be. And um, and I think I think if people understood that their your own happiness was linked into the happiness of everybody else in your country, that you would all work kind of work together to make your where you live, a better place, if you see what I mean. That's what I'd do. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can't make everybody happy, can you? But I suppose the idea of the original idea of uh, eudaimonia is to make as many people as possible happy uh, within you know politics. But the statement that it's okay to kind of crush the odd person, I think it's not. It doesn't say crush them, but it's it's where an individual's happiness is subservient to the happiness of the collective. I think is the way it's put. Um, I don't. I don't agree with that. I. Th I think society should move forward. We should all try to be as happy as we can be, and um, uh, you know, there we go. That includes me, Doc. A mix of Irish and Ulster Irish stock. <laughs> um, yes, in terms of the American population. Yes, Sean. Thank you. Uh, Frank would have hated Trump. I think <laughs> half the world hates Trump, and the other. Strange that the other half maybe admires him. I don't. I don't know what that's about. Um, but yeah, mm. and there we go. So, there well, that sounds really interesting, says Sean. That was, that was a good, good little bit of debate there. Um, Bart Lounger is saying, for example, if the US, if half the people are dissatisfied, which they clearly are, then how is such a bipartisan margin even able to be fixed without a civil war? It doesn't look good, it seems. Um, you just have a society that doesn't solve its problems with violence, Brad. Um, <laughs> that, that's a good place to start. Um, really, uh, you know, war is an extension of politics by any or all means, that kind of thing, you know. And if you think about that, whenever you, whenever you elect, you know, Joe Bloggs or whatever you want to call him, and you put this guy in power, and then he's got a war machine to work with. I don't know. Um, but the, the, the politician, it's, it's, in this country, we get our politicians saying, we're not going to play, stop playing politics. How dare you play politics in this place? And you go, and your politicians, what, you know, what are you doing? What are you, that's what you're supposed to do. But we often point out that we think that most politicians don't know what a proper definition of politi politics is, and that they view politics as government, um, I think, and power. Depends. Our, our politicians are particularly corrupt here. It's um, but it's just it's just a matter of fact, and I think it's the same on the UK mainland. And I, I don't know about the states, but it, it looks like most politicians are working for businesses um, rather than people. If you see what I mean. Hmm. But yeah, just just don't have a society where we're killing people isn't uh, i don't know if that's a, a really obvious answer to your problem or your question sorry park Ranger. but if you have us it's just hey everybody before we talk about this let's not do war or violence or when well, you lock up all the guns and hide the booze <laughs> <coughs> if you see what i mean brad says laughing at Luke, you got me thinking about california uber alleys ken politicians <laughs> uber alleys uber alice yeah uh, can politicians? We, we've got the kind of um, excuse me, my nose a wee bit tickly. Got the kind of sense that the American uh, cannabis laws were. I don't know if this is true. Maybe you can tell me this, but we got a sense that the American cannabis laws got uh, repealed. Is that a word for uh, liberalized or freedom freed up 
but because of um, politicians, housewives out in California being quite bored and wanting to smoke dope and pre be pressure being put on their husbands. I'm not sure if that's true or not. <laughs> that was the general sense we got of it um, over here. <laughs> Sean, please look it up. I'm sure it's free on YouTube, mate. What it says. Parkland, a great answer. Thanks very much. Uh, you're more than welcome. Bark, I am a wee bit ignorant. Uh, to be honest, I don't know the details of American and politics, you know. This would take a while to put in place. I see the media in the US and film and TV pushing this racial divide. I think moving forward is also good, not drudging past. I will say this, Bart Lounger, I think the main arguments about race that are, um, I, I, which I really dislike from all sides are coming out of America. And they're old arguments. And I think race is being used in positive and negative ways in a fundamentally ignorant way where I think a lot of people in America talk about race as if, as they talk about ethnicity or that the color of your skin makes you a different race. It's absurd. And it's a, it's a hundred year old thinking. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the color of your skin and your ethnicity do not make you a different race than me. Um, and it, so that's, an, that's a really interesting thing, I think. And, and I, I think it's really is coming out of the, the media in, in America, you know, I don't know what you guys think, but I, I thought we were all a bit further ahead in our thinking in the world about this kind of stuff. Um, you know, and again, I was telling you what I thought America was like, that it was this, um, my, my wife thought America was wonderful. She was, you know, a lot meant that she's been there. I haven't thinks New York's amazing. Um, again, I've lived in London. What I, I'm not a big fan of big cities, but what I loved about London was just people from everywhere, cultural melting pot. And it was a big, I just thought always America was just like that. It was just, you know, we got to see people from all sorts of places in America. Uh, if you're brought up in Northern Ireland, you, there's no cultural, hardly anything, no no mixing of other uh, ethnic groups really at all here. So, you know, to, to, to see people from other places and cultures for me growing up is on the TV, you know. Mm. And it's often American television and... Um, yeah, I think it's kind of. I think it's sad that uh, I think America's taken a step back that way, and I know I know the history with slavery, etc. There, it's a common history around the world, I think, um, uh, as well. You know, but it, it's yeah. I I don't think the even politicians talking using the race card talking about that they're a different race than a person who's got a different coloured skin. I think it's absurd, and I think I actually think it's really stupid quite frankly, and ignorant. Um, it's my own opinion. But um, uh, as I said, if anybody out there is a different race than me, I'd really like to meet you. Because <laughs> um, I've only just really met humans so far, you know. But there we go. I see two, two one-hour episodes on YouTube on my watch list. <laughs> <coughs> when it comes to politicians, says Brad, I think Cox Barrow said it best when they wrote the song Watch Your Back. Mark Landry, you're correct. Um, was I remember a good one, Brad. I'll tell you what, it's from 2000 AD, and it was issue number 666, and it had it was an episode of Bradley Sprague, and the special guest stars in that 2000 AD episode were the Sisters of Mercy, and as I seem to recall, there's a poster in it of Andrew Eldritch saying, how do you, and they're telling a joke, and the joke is this, how do you drown a conservative MP? Hit him on the head with the toilet seat when he's having a drink. <laughs> so there you go. That's uh, I, I don't know why that's ingrained in my head, but I, I remember laughing my head off way, way back when I read it. And that's an exact reference to where you'll find it, by the way. <laughs> Mark Lewis, you're correct. Most politicians are tech company pawns these days. That's where the money is. It's all about, about the money. It's the same here. Uh, marijuana has been decriminalized, says Sean. Starting in Colorado and Washington states, shortly later California. More about tax income than anything else, honestly. Ah, okay, no worries. I thought I quite liked the story of the board pol pol politicians' housewives wanting more cannabis. I thought that was that was had a nice kind of thought to it, I suppose. But um, <laughs> Brad says, Sean, I find it stimulating, and you seem smarter than I do. I hope you get something. <laughs> do do. Mark Lounge, 100% spot on about race. Everyone is beautiful and has a soul and has great ideas. 
inventiveness, empathy. To boil down people by the color of their skin is modern day barbaric thinking. I, I, I do genuinely th thought that this was a thing of the past. I mean, way in the 50, 60, 70 years at least, you know, World War II or before. Um, it causes a division between the middle lower classes, the power players let it right. Oh, yes. I identify as a Time Lord, says Lord Crook. Excellent. I always say I like to set a, I like to think of myself as a culture of one. Um, yeah, but I absolutely love culture, all, all things. You know, it's good to, if we just looked at things differently, folks. We look at them with a bit of a more interested eye, I suppose. But life can be quite harsh to a lot of us, I suppose, as well. <laughs> Brad says, I'm over the political talk. Doc, please tell these good folk about DR and Quench. I, I will do. Do I have a DR and Quench? Sitting here somewhere, I think, actually. Hang on a second. Do I have a DR and Quench? Possibly, 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 maybe. I don't actually. Um, I'll tell you what, folks. If you give me a wee second, um, I will find a DR and Quench for you. But I have to run to the loo really urgently. So could I uh, intermission for a few seconds and I'll just hit pause. Excuse me a wee second. I'm back. Oh, thank goodness for that. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, <laughs> oh, baby, the destruction of Jim was a Frank Herbert 2008 crossover. It was DR and Quench. Ah, <laughs> I will catch up with a wee bit of this quickly. Uh, -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. And here, here, the Cox Barrow and criminalization of Mary Joanna is also barbaric. Couldn't agree more. Uh, super nice of you to say, brother. <laughs> Thanks. Parts of America are quite mixed, like you said. It's part of a continent. People are spread out. Only part of the population is metropolitan, mainly the big cities and university locations. Hmm. Big cheers, mate. I'm apolitical. I do feel like working class pride. Cheers to that, Brad. Cheers to that. Working class myself. <laughs> working class or working class. Oh, dear. Uh, maybe the destruction of June was a Frank Herbert right just to catch up. So DR and Quench, folks, if you want to see them. There we are. There's DR and Quench by Alan Moore and Alan Davis. Uh, would have appeared in 2008. You can get... Um, I think this is all their stories. I don't think there's too many of them. And they're very, very funny. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we've got DR and, DR and Quench have fun on Earth. DR and Quench go straight. DR and Quench go girl crazy. DR and Quench get drafted. DR and Quench go to Hollywood, I think, is my favourite one. And uh, DR and Quench get back to nature. 
and they're, they're just very, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know if you can see that, okay. Quite violent sort of teenager, teenage aliens who run around in um, sort of hot rods and uh, just shoot things with very big guns and stuff, you know. They're very, very funny. Uh, <laughs> let me see. And you would get, yeah, there's a few of the uh, 2080 sort of star pinups, if you can see what I mean. Used to be sort of posters and episodes and stuff. Um, so they're very much kind of in the animal house kind of mode, I think. Uh, but they're they're really funny. If you haven't read them, it's, it's absolutely worth checking out. Dr. Waldo Hobbs, isn't it? So Dr. Sometimes I do that with my doc. The doctor Dr. Stars stands for diminished responsibility. And um, but my favourite ones where they go to Hollywood to make a film with a script and. Uh, it's something, something, orange is something. <laughs> and it has a bit where Marlon Brando kind of gets killed by all these oranges, and it's it's one of my favourite things ever. <laughs> so that's DR and Quench for you. If you want something else from 2008, it's a rather good read, and it's quite... Uh, that's Zenith. Um, and I'm going to be doing a video on Zenith at some point. Uh, it's a very British... Um, this is Grant Morrison, Steve Yule, very British take on the superhero. Uh, and it's a, it's a very Lovecraftian one. It's very, very good. Um, I think it's a cracker, actually. So there's four volumes to um, to Zenith. And it, yeah, it's a very, very different kind of superhero book, I think. There you go. So that's, uh, But that's DR and Quench. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll definitely try and do something at some point, uh, Brad, on the best of... Uh, something like the best of 2080 or something, you know. On the subject of being a Time Lord, isn't it a bit funny that a Time Lord would hop from one time to the next? Why not find the best place, era, and stay? Hmm. <clears throat> I suppose there's plenty of <laughs> plenty of things to choose, but probably too much choice, I think, would be the problem there, Bart Ledger. Share a stream. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness gracious I'm thinking of looting the looting pirate era in Barbados Arg, laughing out loud variety versus boredom Bark wouldn't you go back to dinosaur era and leave a Nokia 4810 that would blow some minds hmm the, the, the Alan, is it, who is it does the is it Alan Moore does the Fatharg's future shocks uh, there's a lot of really good wee time travel ones there one of my really just got me into kind of close time loop stories, little time trickery stories. And it's always one of those ones. It was just in the comic book, the panel. It shows you them landing the their time machine back in prehistoric era. Guy steps out, squishes something, whole page is black. That's it, everything's gone. Great little things like that. What is the best place era if Ian M. Banks' culture is out there, maybe there and then? Ah, well, the culture, if you read the books, the culture would be uh, around now. <laughs> they're about they've been hanging around up, up in orbit since Star Wars came <laughs> uh, Sean I, I don't know if you've read the state of the art um, but I'm not sure I think it's set around the 70s or early 80s and uh, is it, there's a culture ship in orbit and various culture agents on the earth and incognito but they, they all have Star Trek and Star Wars parties on board the, as they're imitating uh you know, the human culture on the earth. Hmm. But the, yeah, the culture, I think you've got a good, good range of years within the culture stories, don't you? Because uh, Consider, West of Windward is a sequel to Consider Flabas, and I think the events are a set of thousand years after, maybe. I think not, not quite sure, but there's many, many years. It's all to do with the light of a dying star or something that was part of the, part of the war. Um, hmm. <laughs> Sean said it still worked, but it was fine, Brad. Spooky. <laughs> the Nokia 48. Yeah, I've got one of them, I think, somewhere. Got a lot of old phones. Let's get rid of them. Mark Leonard, true, the Industrial Revolution could start thousands of years before its hours, and those people would figure out the Nokia in no time. <laughs> well, it could be, you could substitute it as the Nokia 4810 as the monolith since 2001. Dun dun. <laughs> Maybe some ape man or you know primitive human picks it up and uh, uses that phone to beat somebody else to death with you know. Parkland, there we go. 
Sean McCarthy, anything Grant Morrison is fantastic. Yeah, and it's um, he's Animal Man, I think. Yeah, I'm not joking. These are a really, really good quality. Um, uh, and the, the tie-in with the, the Lovecraftian thing, you know, uh, it's really good. And, it, yeah, I, I remember reading these as they came out, and I, I said superheroes were not really my thing ever. Um but it's a particularly good take on it. Um, it's very kind of psychedelic. He's meant to be like a kind of psychedelic rock star who's a bit of a, a bit of a twat and um, has basic. He can fly a bit and he uses it to make a kind of like a. He's a bit like a George Michael kind of imitator. He's meant to be. He's a pop star. He's a you know, and he ends up getting sort of dragged into it. It's a very Lovecraftian um, set of stories. Zenith, they're really good. Hmm. Well, I suppose the culture is the place where I put it this way, guys. I was saying we we're talking about Arrakis and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, as much as we admire Frank Herbert's Dune and the universe that it's in, I would not want to live there. I wouldn't want to live anywhere in the Empire of a Thousand Worlds. It's an absolutely hostile, horrible, horrible place. But the culture, the culture is the one, yeah, that's where you'd want to live. The culture sounds fun. The cultures, uh, and again, it's Banks, Ian Banks, trying to say that he thought that a lot of science fiction was particularly downbeat in the futures that it presents. So the culture is an attempt to present the most positive, best possible outcome for mankind. And it, it is a bit of a, it's a bit Butlerian, actually. It's, um, if you think about what Samuel Butler says about machines out evolving humans and that our best kind of, our best hope is that we can end up kind of like how we, like dogs to the machines, like how we treat dogs, like a faithful pet. That's kind of what the culture or the humans are kind of along for the ride, but they're, everybody's sort of equal, you know. They're not, <laughs> if you see what I mean. But they are. <coughs> so if anybody hasn't read the culture books, I'd consider Flaybass as the first one. I, I don't recommend it as a dropping in point, to be honest. I think you'd be better reading Use of Weapons or um, The State of the Art, which is the wee collection of short stories first. But I don't know, it's maybe just me, I suppose. Hmm. Let's just catch up a wee bit. Yeah. Uh, Anything Grant Morrison is fantastic. Love the Invisibles. Haven't seen it. Um, Grant is great, says Bart Lounger. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of guys out of 2000 AD. If you. You know, as I said, I kind of stopped reading 2008 a few, a good few years back now, but I had read it every week, made it, all, you know, into my 30s since I was four, um, without fail, pretty much. A uh, big part of my life. There's an awful lot of talent that comes out of that uh, that comic, you know, and they've uh, almost anybody who's worked for 2008, I think, has done incredibly well for themselves in the independent comic, graphic, novel, film world, you know. David says, hi, David. Oh, hi, all. Driving and listening, just saying hi, well parked. Hello. <coughs> hi, Dave. Thanks for joining us. We've, we've jumped a wee bit onto some 2080 stuff, guys, but anybody got any questions on uh, the Fremen, June, Arrakis, any of this stuff, um, or all things science fiction, fire away, or give us your comments. Let's hear them. Uh, Brad says, David, I'm drinking and listening onto my second pint of Pogue's whiskey. <laughs> and whiskey and cola. It's 10 a.m. Pogues whiskey. Hmm. It's not a whiskey I've ever heard of. Is that as in the Pogues, the band? Is that their own whiskey, Brad? <laughs> Bart Lander says, I would go back 2,000 years to the moment when Herodotus tells Plato of the magical land of Atlantis. It would be interesting to see if there were any artifacts. Uh, hmm. Plato has a, a let's see, I don't think would they line up well. Um, if you're picking a place to go for time. There's, there's a, uh, the description of Plato is uh, Plato's description of Atlantis is still there, as, as far as I understand it. He gives you quite clear directions as to where it is, and nothing's there. Mm. My argument for the Atlantis case, folks, would be quite possibly. Um, I don't know. Uh, oh, well, I was thinking about the Minoan civilization, you know, Gnosis. But I think that. Um, uh, Interesting. There's a few, I suppose, a few candidates, if you like. But it, it, they don't, uh, I'm trying to remember where Plato says Atlantis is. Hang on a wee second. 
Let's see. He says, uh, "Well, he's got a fancy." It says, "Cultures map six. There we go." Uh, mentioned in the allegory on the hubris of nations in Plato's work Timaeus and Critias, when it represents the antagonist and evil power that besieges ancient Athens. So this is fictional. Mm -hmm. Source. No, 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 no. no. The pseudo historic embodiment of Plato's ideal state in the Republic. There we go. It was repeated in all the nations of the concept. No, that's not one of what I'm thinking on now. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba. Let's see. Just having a wee quick nosy here. I thought there. Was, there we go. Extending in one direction, 3,000 stadia. But across the centre island, it's 2,000 stadia, 50 stadia from the coast was a mountain that's low on all sides. Broke it off all around about the central island itself is five stadies in diameter. Mm -hmm. He says here, I'd have to go back and read this. I don't tend to trust Wikipedia sources on this kind of stuff. But it says Plato asserted the Egyptians described Atlantis as an island consisting mostly of mountains in the northern portions and along the shore and encompassing a great plain and oblong shape in the south. With those dimensions, so there we go. But yeah, so um, who knows? Where are we? But yeah, it would be interesting to go back to those kind of times. I have to say, I don't know when. I'd I'd, I'd, I'd probably go back to a time when there's no humans on the planet, <laughs> or forward to a time when there's no humans on the planet. I think I could enjoy it better. It's Pogues was going to hit the disappointment Shane. Oh, so as a. <laughs> it is Pogues as in the Pogues, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sean McCall says there are memories of submerged places from the Ice Age that survive in oral histories up to the modern times. If Atlantis has a basis in reality, it's probably in one of these places. Um, yeah, I, I think if it, ha if it was a civilization, though, it's. It, it's I think there's a number of sort of suggestions of things getting destroyed by flood at a certain point anyway. Um, and the flood narrative, you know, is pretty much common to most most of the civilizations around there. The Gilgamesh one's pretty much the oldest one, isn't it? Let's just see. Um, but yeah, I suppose Atlantis is one of those great mythical things, isn't it? The Greeks are one of the societies, the Mediterranean with flood stories, so that actually might be slightly more likely. Mm. A place called Mauritania, which was ruled by the first king of Africa, his name was Atlas. The Ricot, or the Eye of Africa, is also there. It's rings of eroded stone 27 miles in diameter. Mm. Oh, there's so many lovely things in the world to go and look at. But anyways, about June, I can't wait to see this book come alive. All the characters, the environments. I do wish Danny Villeneuve all the luck in the world. Says Bart Langer. Absolutely. I mean, as much as we were talking a wee bit earlier, Bart Langer, about uh, I'm a wee bit concerned about the Frank Herbert's ecological message. You know, it, it, it wasn't massive in David Lynch's film, and the ba the banquet scene was missing from that too. So I'm I'm not that bothered about. You know, I, I hope they don't certainly do something completely different with it and present a different message. But I'm really looking forward to seeing this film. And uh, as I said, I've been I've been no matter what. I'm going to go in there and approach it with fresh eyes and not bring, I mean, arguably I'm one of the people that could bring the most bias to my, you know, to this film to be, oh, if, um, but I'm not like that. I don't go, oh, oh Frank Herbert's books must be this blah, 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 and if it's not that, uh, you know, I, I go in and look at it with a critical eye, I suppose, but um, I, have, I have a good knowledge of the books, and I suppose it's, there are certain things that I'm going to look for. And it's not to do with the details. It's really to do with the spirit, if you like. Um, does that make sense? I just, as long as the film has the right spirit, I think it'll be absolutely brilliant, and um, I'm really looking forward to it because I, I have enjoyed every version of June. Bark Lounge, I, I love the David Lynch film. Um, I think a few of us have said some of us were introduced to the books via the David Lynch film. You know, I imagine some people have been introduced to the books via the TV series as well. But uh, yeah, I can't wait to see it come. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, two and a half hours of that on the screen. I'm really looking forward to it. We're we're going to see it this Thursday, um, before our just before our last episode. 
so we'll see the June film and then we'll have my last episode, which is all the conclusions really and my recommendations. And it's a wee bit of a, there's a, it's a nice wee set roundup, I think, as well. I've quite liked the way I did it, I suppose. But in, in a kind of way that this PhD sort of thing is a bit like my love letter to June, I suppose, as well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Um, um, yeah, I can't, uh, yeah, the, the tensions, it's not the apprehension, you know, what is it? anticipation that's the word i'm looking for it's mighty but it's not i'm just looking forward to it in a really good way uh, as i said it's, it's a wee bit something different haven't been out much uh last year and a half or so so yeah it's and it's so many things i think um carol was saying that if, on your first watch maybe if you're well versed in herbert you're kind of looking at things and going oh that's what the guild looks like ah there's the voice you can maybe be paying too much attention to it to just enjoy it <coughs> So I'm really hoping that I can just go in and relax, if you see what I mean. Not go, oh, that's wrong. I'm not gonna not gonna point anything out. My wife's not red, June, or um, and isn't isn't the biggest fan. If you're gonna she's I have she's been going on, I've got to go see this. <laughs> and she's not too happy about it, but she gets all of this stuff here on a daily basis. So I'd say she probably knows more about June than anyone who hasn't actually read the book. <laughs> so really looking forward to it. Mm. Brad says, of course, sci-fi is dying stories. He wants happy stories. It'd be like what Henry Rollins said about happy songs. Look up this spoken word on YouTube. I think it's called Happy Happy Guy. Henry Rollins. <laughs> <coughs> Henry Rollins band. I don't know. There, there's a few good upbeat science fiction stories. They're quirky. Um... But yeah, the, you're, I suppose, yeah. At the end of the day, I think Ian Banks is 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 right, and so are you, Brad. There's a lot of it's downbeat, Ap apocalyptic, I suppose. Which you know, um, and if, if even if you look at what's the streaming services at the minute, half the stuff's about plagues, and the other half's about you know post-apocalypse. It's it's a ridiculous. It's, people, I suppose, are writing about their own fears at the minute. A lot of modern, you know, stuff that's coming out now seems to be heavily orientated towards that. Hmm. Bart Lender says, if they keep to the environmental issues and the acquisition of resources through colonization, this could be the closest thing to the books. And yes, the right spirit. Yeah, that's what I think that's what we're all hoping for. We all know the film cannot be the book. There's no way. It just, no matter what, it will not happen. So it's just have we got the best of the book and the best of the spirit i think but i just i hope it's got frank herbert's spirit in it i don't know if you know what i mean but if you if you saw the lord of the rings films um and they you know they to, the further they went in the more they became peter jackson's lord of the rings and less J.R.R. tolkien's lord of the rings but that's the point where he did the hobbit and he just took tolkien's name off it it's peter jackson's the hobbit i thought it was appalling you know pardon me and um quite fond of the hobbit as a book and it's limited size and uh, uh and it's a well-written book but uh, the, the thing i had to go see it with my son um, and he's quite into it and i actually for the first i think i said to somebody for the first time ever almost in my whole adult life i fell asleep in the cinema uh during the third hobbit film and i was disgusted that i had fallen asleep in the cinema especially as i i love the cinema i just couldn't think of that happening so it's a testimony to uh, peter jackson Filmmaking is you actually put me to sleep in a film and you're the only director ever to do it. So, <laughs> oh, dude, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? But it's true. I'm genuinely sorry to say it. Not that he's ever going to see this, I suppose. Um, the appalling to put his name on J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. But it's good, I suppose, in one way, it was good not to put Tolkien's name on it, you know. Brad saying, yep, the Pogues have their own brand of whiskey. It's my pre midday drink, being off work and being a CU cashed up Poke. <laughs> I gotta get something to get through the groundhog day. Uh, that's right, you're you're off injured at the minute, aren't you, Brad? I think. Mark Lander says there wouldn't be right without a Pope's brand of whiskey. All is well. All is well. <coughs> I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm imagining it might not be very good whiskey. Um, whiskey's whiskey, isn't it? I suppose when I drink water, I drink water. When I drink whiskey, I drink whiskey. And never the twin should meet. <laughs> I always preferred my scotch, to be honest with you. Uh, Brad says, I'm going, I'm going where streams of whiskey are flowing. Ah, the water of life is whiskey, isn't it? Uh, Brad said, I'm missing my buddy Ether. Yeah, he's not here tonight. Oh, yeah. 
he just bring, brings quite a lot to the party, doesn't he? Uh, I'm sure we'll see him again. Mark Linder said he did a good job with the trilogy, but to turn a 170-plus page book into a trilogy is just simply a cash grab. It was uncalled for, for sure. I, I agree. It was just... Um, and I, I, either that, it was just I love this stuff too much. I want to bring as because I can make nine hour movies. I'll bring as much from this, that, and the other, and throw it in. No, it was a it's a very simple story. I think the Hobbit, and particularly for younger kids. I mean, we can all. I always looked at the the Hobbit as a children's book, and the adult and Lord of the Rings is the adult book that that takes that story on. If you see what I mean. Um. But I do. I don't look at. I don't look at Lord of the Rings as a book, as a kids' book. I, I see it as an adult book. Its main theme is death, but the uh, the Hobbit is a children's book. Its main theme is just an adventure, enjoying your life, taking wonder, stepping outside your door, I suppose, and appreciating your home. Um, there's a lot of good things to teach kids in the Hobbit, I think, and it just made it an absolute mess. And I, I couldn't look at it. It was the it was the uh, the number of frames per second or whatever he did on the screen. It was just horrific. That's why I fell asleep. Actually, it wasn't really. It was my eyes got worn out, you know. Well, there we go. Well, listen, folks. Um, I'll tell you what. I think we've kind of ended up. We've we've certainly walked away from the uh, from the ecological theme, and so on. I'll go for another few minutes, up to half past, if we've got any wee further comments, just to wrap up the evening, and we'll say sort of good night about half past. Um, and we do have. Uh, uh, tomorrow's episode is going to be the final oh no sorry it's the banquet scene the very all important banquet scene that's not in the film so spread the word folks and we'll have a look at that tomorrow night just to catch up with your uh, comments and then Brad saying all you people will be happy to see it here in Australia we have to wait until December the sign on the IMAX is closed for renovations Brad I, th I, I that was kind of doing my head in a bit because I thought Australia is a huge modern country and we'll maybe just go Sydney where you're at but Surely, do you, how many IMAX screens are in Australia? I'm kind of getting this Danny Villeneuve thing has done this film for IMAX, but I know an awful lot of people seem to be finding people. We don't have IMAX. Nobody seems, I don't know, I think, is it America's got IMAX? Canada's got IMAX? But there's none here. <laughs> you know, um, I have a love letter to cinemas on a, on a on a unusual format screen that virtually nobody, I don't know, but... I get the sense that most people aren't going to see it on IMAX because they can't, um, which is, well, a bit bizarre. A long story doesn't equate a good story, says Bart Ledger. I'll get to the bloody point. And yes, it's a splendid book to introduce to young ones. <laughs> was good talking to you, sir. Good night. No worries, Bart Ledger. And uh, <laughs> a long story doesn't equate to a good story. Yeah. Um, mm. I, I, th I actually was really looking forward to The Hobbit. Um, I genuinely thought, my son was younger at the time, you know, I genuinely thought it would be a great thing to take him to see. And I think he was reading it in school at the time. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was just a travesty, I think. Really sad. Uh, but just very difficult to look at. Uh, genuinely hard to look at. I don't know what people were thinking. Brad saying, Pratchett is sort of, kind of, the only writer I consider a happy writer that I read. Remember, I'm the Nietzsche fanboy. <laughs> I'm trying to think of who would be a good happy writer. Um, I don't know anybody who's particularly happy. I don't know why. Like, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, a good sense of humour is great in science fiction. They are, the Strugatsky brothers are pretty funny. I find them funny. And I, f I find Philip K. Dick pretty funny as well. Um, I'm just trying to think. Comedic science fiction. I'm not sure if um, any of you. Uh, ah, I'll tell you what. Does that, do you guys know Old Harry's game? Old, old Harry's game is really good. It has the theme from Hellraiser. Old Harry's game. That's worth checking out. That's a radio drama. Uh, in the similar mode to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, produced by the BBC. And it's it's an existential comedy set in hell. Um, and it's a humanist comedy, I'll say that. And it's funnier. It's far funnier than the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's written by Andy Hamilton. If you want a really, I'd I'd say I'd say Nietzsche's in it actually, bro. Um, almost everybody's in hell is is the is the on ongoing joke. But um, check it out. If if I think somebody might have it on YouTube, you know. 
but there we go. So, uh, yeah, so excited for that episode. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it again, the recap myself, actually, the, the, the banquet scene. And I sort of read it a wee while back. It is quite early on in the book, actually, you know. So there we go. So everyone's saying good night. Bart's saying, David Foster Wallace is a happy writer. If you want a good laugh, please read The Infinite Jest. It's a Wes Anderson movie in novel form. Wonderful stuff. <laughs> night, Brad. Well, listen, folks, uh, thank you very much for the comments and the recommendations. As I said, we'll see you tomorrow night. Uh, after the episode as usual. The episode will be on at 10. It'll be the banquet scene. And then we've got, just after that, we have um, the episode to follow that is on the the, the final kind of ecological transformations of Arrakis up until where it, where it goes boom. And then the very last episode, as I said. So and we'll maybe have a wee chat about that, that film, June, that we're all hoping to see at the end of the week. And uh, we'll do our best not to spoil it too much for Brad as well. Listen, folks, take it easy. Uh, all Say good night to you and look after yourselves where, no matter where you are. All the very best to you now. And we'll hopefully uh, see you all tomorrow. Thanks very much and take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>